Welcome to my first British mystery. This mystery is about the first king of Britain, or the first recorded king of Britain. So do you even know who that is? Well, it's this gentleman. His name is Brutus, and supposedly he comes from Troy. We certainly have a great mystery on our hands here, and we're going to delve a little deep into the truth and facts behind the myth. So sit back, relax, and get ready to hear of Britain's first king. It's important to remember that this is a myth, but there are some really interesting archaeological pieces of evidence, as well as historical record, to back up the existence of Brutus. This is a statue of Geoffrey of Monmouth, of Wales and Oxford. You might know him if you're aware of the King Arthur tales, because this is the man who wrote them down. In his history of British kings, he refers to the first king being Brutus of Troy. Brutus was supposedly the grandson of Aeneas, and Aeneas fought for Priam, the king of Troy, during the Trojan Wars. Aeneas didn't just fight for Priam, he was also the nephew of Priam. Based on archaeological records, because we have found the city of Troy, these wars took place somewhere between 1260 BC and 1280 BC. Now I won't go into too much detail about Brutus's history. They fled from Troy, landed in Italy, settled for a while, and in the end Brutus left, went into southern France, northern France, and left there as well, based on a prophecy, and landed in England. Now we believe that was Totnes. I'll digress a little bit more after we go into a bit more historical background. Geoffrey Monmouth was meant to have written the book in 1136 AD, so that's almost 2,000 years later, but we know that he bases some of his work on authors from the 6th century and the 9th century. But when you read those authors, so that's Bede and Gildas, you quickly realise that they just mainly focus on the Roman conquest and the reaction to it. They talk maybe for one chapter on the history of Britain before that, but nothing in particular detail apart from maybe the Picts coming in from the north. So it's really interesting that Geoffrey Monmouth comes up with the detailed history of Brutus and where he came from, as well as the name of the tribe. So let's start with Brutus landing in England, and he lands in the town of Totnes. Now, that, that's what we believe. That is what it says in the book, and we believe that that town is associated with it, and that town believes that's where Brutus landed, and they even have a stone called the Brutus Stone that you can still find in the town. Geoffrey and Monmouth doesn't go into specific detail about what happens next. All we know is that Brutus makes his way over to the River Thames and sets up the city of New Troy, and along the way he beats up some giants and chases the race into the mountains. Totinus, all the way over to the River Thames and where we have London today, is a massive trek for anyone to take and would clearly take several days, week maybe, to get all the way over there. However, and this is going to be controversial, I have found a town, a village nearby with about 2,000 inhabitants called Tolsbury, which is very close to this location. It has a similar sounding name and there's a number of other little villages nearby with the word Toll in it. Now, whether that is a more, that is a more likely location is very debatable. I'm sure the people at Totnes would not like me saying this. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to travel all the way through all that land in order to get to the River Thames to set up a city. More likely it would make sense to set up location in the town of Totnes. But it's, it's debatable and it's just an idea and there's not much evidence that I've seen around Tolsbury to show that there is a substantial history dating all the way back to 1000 BC. Now, although part of this is considered to be myth, legend, there are elements of history here. So, for example, within the book um, History of Britain, we definitely have accounts of Julius Caesar landing. Now, most historians would read through that material and go, right, it's clearly British biased. It suggests that Julius Caesar was chased out of the country. Whereas, more likely, we'll rely on the Roman sources which say, actually, he went there, he conquered, and then he decided to withdraw and that was the end of that 
And it's interesting to see these two biases, because obviously you've got the Roman context and you've got Geoffrey and Monmouth. But we can also see, based on archaeological evidence, that Geoffrey was probably being biased towards the British having succeeded against Julius Caesar. But there is something really interesting from the Roman sources, and that's that Julius Caesar mentions the Trinovantes, which is something that Geoffrey of Monmouth also mentions. So it seems that both sources corroborate that this tribe actually existed, even though the sources are written, you know, a thousand to two thousand years later. This does seem to exist. Furthermore, the translation of the word in Celtic, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, as well as etymologists, the history of words, seem to agree that the word Trinovantes relates to new people. That's what it translates as. But again, this is still circumstantial stuff. Do, what does that really mean, if anything? And it could still be a mistranslation. However, we do have some archaeological evidence to also back this up. It's very sparse, but there is some evidence. There's quite a bit of archaeological evidence showing, at the very least, there were people around there in the Bronze Age. So we've got swords, we've got axe heads, we've got arrowheads, we've got stuff for agriculture, as well as a Bronze Age sword found at the foreshore of East Mercy. One of the more interesting finds was the sheep and cauldron, which was discovered in 1932. And it's one of the earliest cauldrons found in Britain, and it's considered to be a major importance for the history of technology because it introduced the sheet metal working, which I find quite interesting, but still not enough here to really tie everything in with some sort of Trojan link. But we are still building a picture here. We've got a name, we've got a location, we've got evidence to suggest that we're there in the Bronze Age when the possible landing of Trojans could have taken place. There is a type of pottery in the area called, and I apologize if I get the pronunciation incorrect, but Deverell Rimbry pottery, which is from and located in that area. And according to a company called ResearchGate, who specialize in discovery of scientific knowledge, some of their work had a purpose of acknowledging the existence of ceramic production. And they seem to be inspired by certain morphological evidence that are characteristic of Greek vases. So again, another connection. We've got the name, which is associated with a new group. They've got expertise in metalworking. They've got the ability to make vases, which are very similar to the Greek in style. Although I'll say this, it's very, very important to understand that we have very little evidence as to what language the Trojans spoke. We're not sure if they were Greek or they were for some other culture. So is there a connection there or is it just something that people have picked up and passed on in terms of information and styles and techniques? Is it just the fact that, you know, there was a lot of trade going on throughout the Mediterranean that was going into the UK? And some of that trade included the use and sale of Greek vases. Cremations in Britain were unusual, and the vases that we've just been talking about are connected to cremations. That's what they were used for. A person who had died in some way showing their valour, or that they had manly virtue, or they were a patriot, or there was military glory, these are all associated with reasons to give them a cremation. These are all associated with both Trojans and Greeks, but not so much within the UK. And we can see this through archeology span that cremation seems to be associated with that area of Britain and not for the rest. I think this is just a myth at best at the moment. I think there's some really, really interesting correlations archeologically and historically. We've got sources to support this theory. I don't think there's enough yet that's been found to prove that this is taking place. I did also forget to mention there is a Brutus stone in London as well, which I find quite interesting and you can visit that today. It's a block of limestone that can be found in the Museum of London in Cannon Street. However, there is very little archaeological evidence to show that London was founded by anyone by the name of Brutus. We have no tomb, we have no cremation site, we have no temple. Nothing really exists. However, in Havering, 
recently they did discover Bronze Age materials, so that's just uh, east of central London. And this included items such as daggers, axes, arrowheads, shovels, plows. There was a lot of material there which they're going through at the moment and trying to establish what that all means. So at the very least you could say with London it does have a Bronze Age history. But again, is that enough to connect to Brutus? Probably not. I really hope you enjoyed this video on the first King of Britain, or the supposed first King of Britain. I intend to do more videos, so please like and subscribe and you'll get notifications about these videos as they come up. If you'd like to know more about ancient history, check out my book. Where Should I Stay in Sicily? A Travel Guide and Companion to Ortigia and Siracusa.